I am thinking of a way to sound check without feeling awkward at all. I am thinking of a way to sound check without feeling awkward at all. Everybody's looking at me, thinking, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? Everybody's looking at me, aren't they? I think. <laughs> I am thinking of a way to sound check without feeling awkward at all. somewhat different Wizards Roundtable today. I'm going to turn the reins over to Peter Nevland, Wizard of Ads partner, because he wanted to ask some questions of a couple of writers, one of them being me, the other one being Asia Gregg, on two specific styles of writing that could be helpful to you. Asia is going to share with you how she sold a truck that was in Canada to a new owner in Texas, and he paid a premium for it when there were all these other trucks around that he could have purchased. I'm going to show you some ways that you can improve your recruitment ad writing and why this is a stronger way to do it. You want to stick around to the end because at the end we're going to have an offer for all kinds of businesses out there if you need some help uh, with your writing or crafting of certain ads. We'll critique them and let you know how you can make them better. Let's begin though with Asia Gregg and she tells us that she once had a piccolo that she was trying to sell. Wasn't selling until she changed the words. Well, that was when I was just trying to sell my own personal piccolo and I had it on Craigslist for eight months and I was just listing the stuff that I thought I would look for if I was in the market for one, just the straight facts. Right. And it didn't sell for eight months and I didn't want it anymore. You know, it's not like it takes up that much physical space in your house, but it yeah. It takes up a lot of mental space in your head if you know what a piccolo is. <laughs> so I wanted to. I know, it's, I know it's there and I need to get rid of it. Exactly. <laughs> you can hear it talk to you at night. So you just want to let it go. So you got to sell it. And so what did you do then after the, the first version kind of didn't sell for eight months? What'd you do? I got, I got mad. And so nice. I, uh, I just wrote this ad. Just, I just didn't care at this point. I said, it's already not selling, you know, what's the worst that could happen. And so I just wrote this ad and published it and I went to bed and eight hours later, I had hundreds of offers in my wow. inbox when I woke up the next morning. Okay. Now, so, so let's, let's get the details first and then we'll, we'll get to the writing part. Um, the details of it, you put it up for how much money and it ended up selling for how much money? It sold for the same amount that I asked for 300, which was you a really good like, price. Rate, yeah. I mean, you didn't raise, you so you didn't raise the price at all because you were like, crap, man, all these people want it. Let's see who really wants it. No, no. Since I already listed it for that price, I wasn't going to raise it. Wow. A marketing consultant who also has integrity. This is really great. Okay. So you sold it for the same price, but you had hundreds of offers, whereas the other one didn't, you didn't have any bites for eight months. And yeah, uh, so what did, what did you do? That, what, what changed? What changed in your writing style that caused people to, you know, want to have it no matter where they were? Well, the first version was just a bullet point list of facts of, you know, Oh, been known for this long recently, you know, retuned, you know, had it appraised, all this stuff, you know, just listed stuff that I thought I would want to know, you know, buying an instrument. Yeah. And instead, this other ad, I took out every fact except two facts and the whole rest of the ad, I think it was 500 words or something like that. The rest oh, of it wow. was just fantastical, made up stuff. They call the trumpet God's instrument the instrument that takes a month to learn and a lifetime to master. Forget that. I'm giving you the chance to own Satan's instrument, the instrument that takes a second to hate and a lifetime to get used to. If your goal is world domination, getting the ball rolling on the apocalypse, or simply disarming someone who's a little too rapey, this miniature flute of terror will hold the game down, and how. Brought to you by Lucifer himself, this 4SP silver-plated Gemeinhardt Piccolo will serve his evil minion well. 
From its compact, arthritis-inducing body, this pipe will unleash a sound that can bring entire crowds of people to their knees in pain and surrender. If you're thinking of starting a bloody coup, leave the AK-47s and sarin gas at home, son. This pick is all you need. This instrument has the ability to sing an A five lines above the staff so crisp and clear, if you're not careful it may actually cleave your conductor's brain clean in half. Its highest note is one only dogs can hear, that composers have dubbed X. Apart from the oboe, this is the only instrument able to kick a field goal of pain right between the goal posts of your unfortunate target's neurons, resulting in synaptic misfires, blown mental fuses, and a complete breakdown of all left brain activity, leaving the right brain to writhe in pain and confusion whilst scrambling all bodily motor functions. Any soul unlucky enough to wind up on the business end of Beazelbub's piccolo will instantly be reduced to the fetal position and revoked of their right to free will. Aside from violating several Geneva Convention protocols, this wailing weaponry can produce frequencies that wreak havoc upon others by causing sudden unexpected nosebleeds, aphasia, heart palpitations, aneurysms, loss of sanity, unexplainable rage, spontaneous combustion, abandonment of the will to live, anal leakage. It's a common mistake to think that the piccolo also has side effects on its user. Many claim it causes acute narcissism, but in reality, the only people drawn to this instrument are already delusionally narcissistic, have serial killer tendencies, and show traits as promising future dictators. Because of this instrument, I now rule over my own sovereign land where I preach from the balconies and lounge in my throne popping bottles while getting fanned with palm fronds waved by ridiculously hot cabana boys. Tomorrow's forecast, whatever the hell I want. Since I'm living the dream, I'm retiring from my reign of terror and passing the torch. Being evil is an arduous, exhaustive effort, and this musical scepter cannot be played by your average white bread vanilla villain. Only the most cunning, dexterous, morally ambiguous, and questionably sane may apply. Who among you is worthy? $300 or best offer. Willing to throw in a box of gravel and ship. So, that, so it's like you you put the the fact to draw them in. It's like the interesting fact, and then the rest of your copy was basically entertainment. This thing, you know, I'm I'm weaving a story to give you to make it worth more to you because now it's it's got it's been imbued with magical powers. So it's interesting. So you got mad, and I don't know if you realize that we always say it. You know, Wizard Academy, or at least Roy always says it that uh, talented people. Uh, we teach people how to do consciously what talented people do unconsciously. And what you did unconsciously was you started with facts that would grab attention. And then you started using insider language and turning this piccolo into a magical uh, device that would satisfy all of the insider dreams of any piccolo player, any musician um, who would know these jokes. And so what it did was it, it drew in all the people who um, knew, knew that language. And so, so what you were doing was you were basically saying, hey, I know who you are. I know what you need. I know how great this piccolo is. And anybody who'd been through those conditions went, oh, my goodness, that's me. And this piccolo could satisfy my, you know, emotional, it's like it just suddenly it became the most uh, attractive thing going for anybody who was looking for a piccolo or even anybody who'd known music. So you had people probably forwarding this out to people saying, hey, don't you need a piccolo? I saw this thing and I just thought of you. That would be amazing. It's, and, and you excluded, notice what you did, you excluded the people who... Um, who didn't play piccolo or didn't understand music. People yeah. who, who didn't get it, they go like, I, I don't get this. But people who did play music, it caused them to be even more attracted, which is so powerful. And I mean, that's, that's really the, the art of persuasion. You took people who normally would not be motivated to buy a, uh, maybe to be even, to even look at a piccolo, but because you used insider language, you activated all the people who knew about this thing. And, you know, once you press that button, then they're excited. Now I got to share it with other people. And suddenly you, you multiplied all the eyeballs that are looking at your product that you had to sell. That's pretty powerful. And it, and it had a nice side benefit too, of 
people just loved reading it, even though they knew it was an ad. It was so entertaining that, you know, it, it became more than an ad. It became, like, you know, its own joke that people just enjoyed sharing with other people to make other people laugh because everybody right. likes making other people laugh. It makes you well liked. It makes other people feel good. How so that was just for your own personal deal. Now you're you're doing this for other people like people are paying you to do this for them to sell stuff that they have. Um, tell me about that. And how has your approach changed or what do you have to do when you're selling stuff that's not your own, that maybe you don't know all the insider details um, about the stuff that you're trying to write an ad for now? I had to sell a truck for one client and I didn't know anything about trucks, but I know truck people and I know that they love joking around. And so it was a simple Google search to see what truck people were joking about. And it basically wrote itself after that. Let me pull up the ad. I can't remember what it was now. I don't remember how much he was selling it for. He was selling it for average price. I think a little bit above average because it had a new windshield in it. No, it had a cracked windshield. And he was still selling it for a little bit above average price. And it was in Edmonton. And it was bought by a guy in Texas. And at the time, and it was only up for not even a day. It sold within an hour or so of him putting it up. The guy that bought it in, uh, he wasn't too far from Houston. And I looked up on the Craigslist on Houston and there were over a thousand 2003 F-350 Fords for sale. Same, same wow. truck. So this guy could have gotten his pick but, of Fords that were right there up the, up the streets, but he, he went to Canada because of what you wrote. Wow. Yeah, because all the all the other ads were exactly the same. That's so funny. I, I've actually talked to uh, I've talked to used car guys and said, "Oh yeah, I could turn around and sell this car for you know more than I just bought from you." Type of deal, and they're like, "That's impossible. There's no way you could do that. It's just not. It's not not you're not able to do that." And I was like, "Well, there's some something invisible that uh, actually will add no value to the truck, but." will add value to the truck. I can do that. It's called words. I can use words actually to increase the value of this, this car. You know, they're like, Oh, it's impossible. It's impossible. It's not. She's right there. She does it all the time. I wrote an ad for a buddy. He had this Kia Spectra, this old Kia Spectra that he tried to take to the dealership and they laughed him out of the dealership because he wanted 800 for it. And they said, you're lucky to get 150, you know, like we'll take it from you as like a favor. Right. And uh, he, he wanted 800 from it. So he had me write the ad and he sold it within a couple of days for 800. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I, told nice. him, I told him he needed to, I told him he should walk back into that dealership, just waving the money out of like, see, look. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, so did you find the ad? Yeah, I did. Read? Ready to be uncomfortable? Come on. There are two types of people in this world. People who like Fords and people who are wrong. The Ford F-Series has been Canada's best-selling truck for over 52 years. Consistent and dependable. It is everything that a Dodge is not. This Ford can do almost everything a Chevy can, except randomly catch fire, because I heard them Chevys run a little hot sometimes. This is a work truck. If you're looking for a pretend to work truck, then go to a Nissan store. In some towns, they call it the wrecking yard. Unlike other wagons, this 2003 Ford F-350 isn't afraid of getting a little work on it. It's got a small dent in the front bumper, but that just gives it character. Could use a new windshield also, that's Edmonton for you. Other than that, she's clean, well-maintained, and built Ford tough. A word of warning, the interior is very roomy. The vertically challenged may need a car seat and pedal blocks to operate. Don't forget your sippy cup, ain't that right, Rick? The leather interior crew cab comes with all the lariat bells and whistles. The heated front seats keep you cozy while you sip coffee and laugh at your buddy trying to dig his lifted Tacoma out of the snow. Sometimes it takes them Yoda boys a minute to ask for help. They can be a little stubborn. That's just the nature of the breed. Call this rig Optimus Prime because it can transform from hauling trailers to hauling tools by switching out the tailgate. Sorry, no heated tailgate package available. You're thinking of a GMC. Got to keep your hands warm if you're going to push your truck home. Speaking of hauling trailers, this F-bomb 
comes with a fifth wheel hitch as well because that was this 4x4's previous job, moving trailers from here to there. The V8 engine has all new fuel injectors, giving it maximum pulling power. So when your buddy with a city boy Honda Ridgeline needs to move his RV, you'll be on speed dial. With some with brand new, some would say aggressive tires, this pick em up truck can pull your buddy Silverado out of that ditch again. You hear how they're making Chevys more aerodynamic to save on gas when Fords tell them? They say that over 95% of Toyotas are still on the road. The rest managed to make it home. But with only 200,000 kilometers, this three quarter ton is barely broken. So what's next? How do you take this truck for a test drive? Just follow these easy steps. One, if you need to sell your Chevy first, here's a tip. Try doubling its value by filling the tank. Two, if you wanna get down here, but you own a Dodge, Check the last two pages of the owner's manual. That's where they put the bus schedule. Three, if you're driving a GMC but need to get here fast, try shutting off the engine to cut your time in half. Did you know a Sierra can go from zero to 60 in less than 15 seconds if you push it off a cliff? Four, <laughs> if you're trying to un... <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> Keep going, sorry to interrupt with my laughter. That's all right. Four, if you're trying to unload a Toyota, increase your chances of a sale by customizing it with working brakes. How's that frame weld holding up there, bud? Five, if you're bringing a Nissan, will you be sitting up front with the tow truck driver so we know who to give the directions to? Six, and if you're thinking of buying a Honda Ridgeline, then we've got some blinker fluid to sell you. We hope to see you soon. Uh, that's awesome. That's just that's fantastic. <laughs> I love it because you just you just ticked off everybody who's got who owns a different kind of brand of truck than Ford. But anybody who's looking for a Ford um, goes, oh, I'm going to be so happy owning a Ford and not owning these other crappy should be at the bottom of a cliff trucks. You know, right. amazing. Any any other any other tips that that you know consciously that could help somebody who's either writing, writing an ad or someone who's wanting to know, is this ad that I'm looking at good or not? Well, first of all, it, it can't look like any other ad that's on there. It's, it has to have an engaging first mental image. The first sentence yeah. or the first couple sentences have to make you go, what? It has to right. put an image in your mind that is completely different from what you were thinking about before. And then the following lines have to make you want to continue that thought. It has to be more interesting than what your reader was thinking or reading before. That's very important. Um, yeah. And then all of the copy that follows has to be reinforcing that first line uh, flowing through the rest of the body copy that makes you want to keep reading. You don't want to stop. It's, it's like a, yeah. like a, you know, like a, like a ice luge or something, you know, you just keep going and building momentum. And then of course you have the last mental image, which always needs to be, in my opinion, some what of a form of a mic drop, you know, if it's right, if it doesn't feel like a mic drop, you have to go back and redo it. Mm -hmm. It can't just fizzle out. Yeah. Yeah. You want that boom, that kind of like uh, where people are just wowed by the end, like either, either how did they get back to the beginning or just, oh, that was so awesome. You have nothing more to say type of thing. Yeah. And, you know, you got to get past Broca because anything that Broca thinks it's seen before, it's, you know, immediately going to toss it out the window. It's got to break a pattern that yeah. a pattern that broke that thinks it knows. And when you say broca, I, for all of you out there who are listening, when Asia says broca, she means there's a part in your uh, an area in your brain that is all is looking for things that it's either seen before or hasn't seen before. And uh, when when that that broca's area is actually about this pattern recognition and and word translation and stuff. And when it sees something it hasn't seen before, then it stops judging and analyzing and starts enjoying. And so as long as you can do something that somebody is like, well, that's different. 
now their right brain, the imaginative, the artistic side is activated and they get into the place of entertainment. And before they know it, they're liking this thing before they even decided whether they need it or not. It's, that's not an issue anymore. Now it's just, I like it. How could I get it? type of thing. So you're, you're basically bypassing the reason center and just going straight to the emotions, which is where we make our decisions. We make our decisions with our emotions, with our heart. And then we use our logic to justify what the heart has already decided. So, so Johnny, let's switch to you. You've been very gracious and very quiet. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, said that, you know, you write these great recruiting ads. Tell me about your first experience writing a recruiting ad um, kind of, I guess we could say a Wizard of Ad style recruiting ad and and what you've learned since then and and maybe, yeah, just take us through that. Well, you know, I, I think one of the things that always has stuck out with me when I had written recruitment ads you know, years ago was A, they all sound alike. They all kind of had this boilerplate. Um, here's the position. Here's the hours. Here, here are the benefits. Uh, you know, some BS line about unlimited earning potential or, you know, something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, so I always try to turn the mirror around and say, all right, show me the character of the person who's going to be working for this company. And that, that, that's profoundly more important. I think when, um, I think when we started writing the ads that, uh, uh, that go out on Indeed or LinkedIn or one of those things, I, th I think one thing um, that is important or, or was new to me was um, the the length. Uh, they're longer than they probably should be. Yeah. Um, and but that's that's a filtering mechanism in there um, because if you're if you're serious, you're going to go through it. Uh, if you're not serious, you bail, and that saves the that saves the business owner a lot of time. Um, and I think the other thing that um, that is key is that it's uh, particularly for a, a smaller business is that it should be in the business owner's voice. Um, I should get a sense of who I'm going to go interview with uh, before I ever uh, send in my resume. So how do you do that? How do you get in the business owner's voice? Or is that just a function of having written ads for the business owner already and you kind of know their voice? Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's important is to come in cold and don't and you don't know the rest of the campaign. I think one of the things that we talk about so often is how do you how do you get alignment through all the channels um, that someone is advertising, whether it's on Facebook or radio or a billboard or uh, or their recruitment ads um, is get some sort of alignment in in feel, in wording um, and uh, and in approach. And so. You know, when, when you can accomplish that, um, then you've shared with them the, the character of the business owner. So, so Johnny, now I know on these recruiting ads, you don't start off with trying to share the character of the business owner. You start off talking about the actual person that you're wanting to recruit. Now, you've never met any of these people. How do you, how do you speak to things um, to a person who you've never met? But stuff that they go, how does he know that I would think about that? How do you how do you come up with that kind of stuff? Talk to talk me through that. Well, I think it's the thing that we say so often is is knowing what to leave out. Uh, and as Asia had pointed out, uh, you know, it, it's okay to speak in um, in insider language. And so, what I'm I guess what I'm looking for really is more of a psychographic or values approach to what that person is. Um, so if I can, if I can speak in such a way that it, it resonates with someone who shares those values, shares those traits, um, then everything's going to start to lock in. If that makes sense. Right. I, think, I, uh, I recently, yesterday I did a search on indeed.com. All I uh, searched was rock star. <laughs> And everybody likes the word rock star. Yeah. You know, there were over 5,000 hits for people looking for rock stars. Wendy wow. wants a rock star. Jimmy John's wants a rock star. Uh, HVAC technicians, they want a rock star. You know, administrative assistants, you know, Top Golf, they all want rock star. Cheesecake Factory, they want a rock star. Sure. Or a ninja sure. or a guru. They don't really want a rock star if they knew. If they thought about what a rock star, like a rock star is someone who intentionally crosses the boundaries 
um, that normal people don't. And if you think about the kind of person that you want to work for you, yes, you want someone who um, exceeds expectations. I think that's what they mean. But in actuality, if you start you start trying to uh, uh, attract a rock star, you're you're going to get somebody that might not be the best team player. You know, Johnny. So you were looking for that Alaska. Now, did you find that? Did you did you think of some other examples? Kind yeah, of like no, and it, and it speaks to exactly what you were just talking about. In fact, this was an ad for somebody who needed to be very detailed. This is for a a, a coordinator for an install, uh, an air conditioning install company, and their job really is to you know make sure the parts are there, make sure the trucks are ready, make sure you know, it, it, there's a lot of little details um, that go into it, and so you got to be uh, got to be ready for that. So. We said this detail maniac needed as coordinator at family heat and air company. All the presidents in your wallet face the same direction. Your shirts are all arranged by color. One extra look in the mirror, because for you, it's got to be right. It's not easy to find someone who has a thing for organization, but something tells me you might be that somebody. We're hiring an install coordinator at Alaska AC. We're a busy company. They're making sure our install team, equipment, and trucks find their way to our happy customers without mistakes is going to be your number one job. As an install coordinator, you'll organize, measure, and monitor installation KPIs and keep the install teams informed and schedule them uh, uh, to head out on the job. It's a, it's a daily game of chess where you need to think about one thing while writing down something else and talking to an install pro. Sloppy dressers, corner cutters, and procrastinators are not welcome. Sharp thinkers, problem solvers, and expert planners are strongly encouraged to apply. Now here's where you start to get into the stuff that, uh, that people think you need to have in a, um, in a recruitment ad. You'll start at $16 an hour, and when you show us you have forward-thinking instincts and organizational skills, you'll be making $20 an hour in no time plus a whole hunk of other benefits, including health, life, dental, vision, uh, 401k plans, state-of-the-art tools, lots of opportunities to grow. Um, mostly, we need you to be on our team. We need to trust you won't need hand-holding. You'll need to show up to work on time, and you won't be Captain Complainer. Details is the name of the game at everything we do at Alaskan AC. Getting a new furnace or air conditioner means a disrupted day for our customers. So we spend we spend extra time making sure it's planned with precision. If somebody is missing a part or gets an address wrong, it can throw the whole job off and mean another disrupted day. And because we're particular about checking off all the boxes, your first employment test is in this paragraph. When you reply to this job, you'll need to write, I'm a detail maniac in the subject line. The non-detailed people will completely miss this part. A smart cookie like you will follow instructions perfectly. If you love solving puzzles, planning events, and coordinating schedules, I'm waiting to hear from you. And, oh, so awesome. That's just great, you know? And I love it. You know, both of you, Asia, you and Johnny, have two different styles of writing, and yet you're using this same technique fabulously uh, to attract people, um, you know, I, I just love it. That I love that one line, the uh, Captain Complainer. It made me think of <laughs> Captain Complainer, you know, Captain Caveman from uh, the Flintstones back a long time ago. Uh, Asia, you're probably too young for that reference. I don't know if you ever saw Captain Caveman. You know, and I think you got to be willing to do what uh, what we always refer to as magical thinking of, uh, of yeah. taking it just a little notch past uh, what most might think of as absurd. Uh, you know, it, does somebody I, really put all the presidents in order in their in their wallet? Uh, maybe some do. Um, but it's just it's just silly enough to go. Oh, yeah, that's that's my neighbor or that's me. I love that line. That was my favorite line so much because it's specific detailed imagery you're controlling as best as you can what the audience sees in their mind when they read that attention to detail you can't you can't control what they see when they read that you know you can't guide their right. mind where you want them to go if you're saying concepts like attention to detail you know that means different things for different people each line becomes a portal into a whole new world and when you get people, give people a portal into a whole new world in their imaginations, they forget whatever they were previously doing and put all their focus 
on what you are telling them, and that causes retention of the words that you're saying to increase and skyrocket and go way up. I mean, that's just just huge, you know? Use the specifics yeah. and not use more specifics than you need to. Right. I, I think, you know, we have to always remember what we're charged with. Our charge is selling a product or, or getting these recruits to come in and interview. And so that that can't ever be, you can't ever let go of that. Uh, it's very right. easy. I shouldn't say easy, but it, it, you, know, you can, you can write something that's weird and wild and, and not so. Um, but if it, but if it disconnects from the, uh, the goal of getting somebody in there, then you've, you've wasted words. Yeah. They yeah. have to be, they have to be braided together. You can't at the best ones. You can't talk about the entertainment without talking about the, the product. You know, they're intertwined. Right. You can't talk about one without the other. Tell me, tell me if I missed anything here, but if I could summarize all this, uh, I think I found these points. Number Longer. one, that, that thing that we just said, think about the ideal person that you want to hire, the character that's in their heart of that person first. And think about the way that person acts, the kinds of things that that person would do. And just, you could even compile just a list without even writing, trying to write something, just just jot down a big list of all those types of things that you might not use all the list. You might only use three or four of those things, but at least have a list of those things. And then start, you know, Asia said this great thing, start with an incredibly powerful mental image that is more captivating than anything else that they've been looking at for the last 30 minutes. And um, don't stop until you have an opening line that will grab them. And then your next lines need to reinforce that. Then use some specifics. You got to use specifics that connect with their personality, specific things that would make them go, how in the world did they know that about me to draw them in? And once you've drawn them in, then you got to give them a feel for the type of the type of job what they're going to be doing on a daily basis. Because remember, this is about them. You need to be describing the kind of job that they would love to do, even if it's not in the field that they think that they would ever be in. If they're getting to do all the things that they like to do on a daily basis, they're going to love it. And then the next thing is that you've got to make sure you're talking to them in the style of the owner so they get a feel for what the company is like. And then you've got to have some details you know, uh, and, and that I'm talking about recruiting ads, but this works if you're selling a product too. They've got to have a feel of the kind of business that they're going to buy from and whether they like and trust this business. And then there's got to be some details of the actual product or details of the actual salary and the benefits that are in there, whether it's recruiting ads or whether it's product ads. I mean, these are really emotional response. These are emotional direct response ads for recruiting or for products. And then find a way to weed some people out, put some slightly misleading directions in there uh, with some, you know, subsequent directions that only detailed people or only people who are really good, who really care about what they're reading are going to get and they're going to respond to so that we can turn the haystack into just a small pile of needles. It's a whole lot more manageable for business owners. And once you do that, then you just need to close with something really big and really powerful that's going to be like a mic drop so that people go, wow, how in the world can I get in touch with them? Or goodness, that was an incredible ad. Or wow, I know somebody exactly like this that I've got to send this to because that was just good all the way through. If you do that, then you're going to be solving a whole lot of problems, either for business owners or for customers who want to find something that fits them, right? Because this is about, you know, when you look at buying a, a truck, if you look at buying a, a, or, or joining a, a company to work for, that is a big commitment. And so people are looking for something that feels like home, that feels like they fit. And when they can find that using words, suddenly they are willing to do a whole lot more than they would than just for bullet point. Guess what? This is the job. This is what it requires. This is what it takes. If you've got a resume, send it to so-and-so. We'll get back to you if we care about you and think that your hair is you know, worth having in our uh, collection of wigs or whatever. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> saying silly, stupid things that are halfway entertaining and people go, that guy is really weird. He's probably not a very good marketing consultant. Anyway, 
<laughs> Did I miss anything in that summation of, of the style? Is, is there anything that I left out? You know, the only thing that, that came to mind is whether it's a piccolo or a truck or a $16 an hour job, if there's not much difference in the thing, differentiate the ad. I mean, you can, you, you've got, you've got to somehow uh, make it stand out because yeah, every Ford truck looks like a Ford truck, but if you can make the, the ad different, every $16 an hour, it's not, not necessarily that hard to find a $16 an hour job. Um, and so make it distinctive in and of itself and you're likely to get more, more response. Yeah. Johnny, um, Asia, maybe I'll ask this question. Would you guys be willing if there was a business owner out there that said, Oh my goodness, you know, I've got to get these guys. Um, if somebody, or, or maybe they said, Hey, I've got this recruiting ad. I want to try my hand at this, somebody out there, and they sent in a, a recruiting ad to you, or they sent in a product ad that used these techniques and said, would you evaluate this? Or maybe even a business owner goes, hey, what would it take to get you to write our ads? Um, would you be willing to hear that? Could people send in some ads to us and maybe we give them feedback on it? Would, would that be cool? That's a splendid idea, Peter Nevland. Yeah, how, how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we make that happen? Well, as you've been seeing here at the bottom of the screen, name and email addresses and, and Asia's as well. And um, yeah, send them in and uh, we'll, we'll be more than happy to look at them or if there's you know, something you want us to tackle. You okay with that, Asia? I just volunteered yeah. you. Peter just volunteered so, us both. That's right. So, so you heard that right here. So what we're offering, we are offering free consulting right now. Send us an ad. We'll be happy to review it and give you feedback. Um, and if you are like, Hey, we want you to write a bunch of ads. We want, I mean, obviously if you don't think that Johnny and Asia are worth hiring by now, well, we probably don't want to work with you. Um, but you should contact them and I'm sure they'd be happy to tell you how much it would cost to, uh, do business with them. And I mean, because ultimately what's going to happen, you know, Asia, she's selling trucks and cars and stuff like hotcakes for, you know, this Edmonton dealer, you know, and people are contacting them from all over North America to buy them. I mean, do you think you want more people contacting you to buy your stuff? And Johnny's causing recruiting to be a whole lot easier for employees. And if you'd like him to do that for you and also probably give you a lot of great strategy advice on the way, because both of them are brilliant people, I think you should contact them. And uh, you should see what it takes to get them on their team because what's going to mean is going to mean a little bit of money to them, but a whole lot more money going into your bank account. Wouldn't you like that? I think we all would. Man, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for uh, giving us your secrets. And uh, man, I sure hope I sure hope a lot of people take us up on this offer because uh, if you don't, you're going to be really sad that you missed out on the genius of Johnny and Asia. If you have any thoughts or questions, please put them in the comments below. And you heard Peter, if you are interested in us helping you, send us some uh, copy that you're working on, regardless if it's a, uh, it's a it's a commercial or a recruitment ad or even something you're going to put in Craigslist like Asia is so brilliant at. And we'll take a look at them, critique them, and get some information back to you and see if we can't help you improve them. Here's how you get in touch with us.